apologize for the quality of my voice. I am quite ill at the moment. Captions are available in English. I suggest you use them. Uh, lag comp is fairly common knowledge now. So rather than a bunch of random clips, you need details. Just how much does lag comp affect your gameplay? This is a demonstration of what I've been doing in real games for the last two weeks. What I'm looking for here is exactly when players are able to see one another. Both consoles are wired to the same local network, resulting in approximately zero ping. For higher pings, I'm using network emulation as I did for Modern Warfare 3. Delays to both upload and download are split evenly for a realistic portrayal of the desired latency. As the data comes in, you can begin to see some interesting results. First, there is a delay at zero ping, assuming there must be an unforeseen latency on my network, or a serious mismatch between the location of the player model and its camera, another method must be used. At zero ping, from muzzle flash to red screen, the player continues to have a significant delay. However, the host has no delay. With increased ping, the player's delay shows an approximately equal increment. Switching to a moving host and a stationary player, we see a very different pattern. There is a statistically insignificant delay, perhaps only half ping. These and other results were highly suggestive of an error in my network simulations giving Black Ops 2 the benefit of the doubt despite being unable to locate any problems on my end. I proceeded to redo the entire section by directly connecting to the modems provided by two separate ISPs. Real-world testing mirrored the simulations, confirming all of the data between these points. The time required for this verification caused me to delay the release of my review. I know some of you were very unhappy about that. Basing this review off of false information is a waste of both your time and mine, and I will have none of that, even if I lose viewers over it. Replicating these results with no user hardware or software interference, not even a router, is enough to be certain this is a common experience. Now confirmed, we have a baseline delay on all player actions, a linear increase to this delay approximately equal to the player's ping and an insignificant delay for the host. This creates a massive host advantage. As authoritative movement interpolation does not occur in Black Ops 2 until a ping of over 800 milliseconds, and extrapolation is not used to counteract this choice, players moving from cover acquire a situational advantage. For everyone else, they are still behind cover. Likewise, players moving to cover die after reaching it, as they are not actually there yet. In player versus player situations, we have a larger initial delay, leveling out as pings increase. However, this is inherently subject to a greater deviation. This delay I'm discussing is for seeing another player, but if they have achieved a synchronized playback using timestamps, how does this affect gameplay? Using a real game this time, here is how it all comes together. From the data collected earlier, expected delays can be found for each player. As the moving player finally enters view, we have the sight delay within the predicted range. Instead of counting every frame for reaction time, I will simply compare it. As one player was delayed in seeing the other, so too should be its reaction time. With this shot, we have the reaction time for the stationary player, who has now died. Note the kill delay is equal to the sight delay, therefore we can expect the stationary player would have survived with a significantly faster reaction time. 
faster by an amount of time greater than that player's delay, to be precise. To put this into perspective, here is a short clip of my gameplay. With this reaction time, if you were playing against me, your bullets would need to be hitting me within 100 milliseconds, as the average human reaction time is around 200 milliseconds for just simple actions. You wouldn't even see me, let alone be aimed and shooting at me. When the situation is reversed, I would only survive if it took you over half a second to react. Part of this lag comp is great. Unlike Modern Warfare 3, laggy players do not obtain an advantage, nor does the host have a disadvantage. All players have a relatively equal experience. But that is where its positive qualities end. While this has been a success in terms of equality among the players, that equality is of a terrible experience comparable to having a very poor host. The delay for all player actions has everyone playing with three bars before even considering ping far outside the range of competitive play. On top of that, the lack of interpolation for client movement creates a significant advantage for players turning corners, or otherwise moving from a location where they could not be seen. Together, these two problems create a typical advantage or disadvantage from 200 to 400 milliseconds or greater. This is why most players appear to have extraordinary reaction time. This is why players complain of instant death and this is why I have been opposed to this change to lag compensation since the beginning. It did not work in Black Ops 1, it did not work in Modern Warfare 3, and it still does not work in Black Ops 2. In fact, by effectively forcing a delay on player actions but not on the host, they have done the unthinkable. They have made host advantage worse, the only reason for modifying lag comp in the first place. Quoting Valve on lag compensation, Improper changes may cause more negative side effects than actual benefits. Lag has always been the scapegoat, blamed for every undesirable experience that wasn't obviously a bug. It was never the player, it was never the game, it was someone's internet connection. If they died instantly, they could direct their anger toward their ISP. As long as network latency exists, players are able to hide behind it, even from themselves. Removing this latency presents more issues than simply coding lag comp. That blame will need somewhere to go, and it will inevitably land on the game itself, in this case, a game that is far from ready for that spotlight. This is not something we players can fix. Perhaps it is our responsibility to inform the developers of the consequences of their actions, but they are the ones who must act. Yet it appears their pride and ambition blind them to reality. We only buy these games because they are part of the Call of Duty series. But we must now go back at least three releases to play a game that still embodies the spirit of Call of Duty. For how long can we continue to live in the past before we finally let go? The moment we accept those games are in the past is the moment this series dies. None of the recent games can stand on their own. The real tragedy here is how simple the problems are, along with their solutions. Functioning lag comp is just a copy-paste away, but what of the rest? In a game such as this, everything is interconnected. If only one part of the game falls short, the consequences are felt throughout. Perks are right at the center of this, directly affecting and being affected by all aspects of the game. Look at the Tier 3 perks. Dead silence and awareness. These both depend on being able to hear footsteps, yet footsteps in Black Ops 2 are embarrassing. Not only are they almost impossible to hear, they are interrupted by excessive screaming that isn't coming from someone's microphone. better off listening to music instead, making both dead silence and awareness useless. Next we have Tac Mask. Everyone uses shock charges. Whether camping, killing campers, defending objectives, or just spamming across the map, everyone has a shock charge ready. 
This makes tack mask a necessity, no matter what your playstyle is. Dexterity is something any run and gun player would equip, if not for two serious problems. First, lag comp, making it quite likely you'll simply die before you make use of the faster aim. Second, you won't be sprinting very often. Extreme conditioning, the running perk, is pretty much useless. Not only are you forced to run two tier 3 perks and still give up tack mask in order to use it with dexterity, but it only lets you run twice as far. Prior games included infinite sprinting as a way to both keep players in the action and to make the perk useful in comparison to others such as sleight of hand. This was an improvement back when it was introduced, and now both Modern Warfare 3 and Black Ops 2 have thrown it away. As you can see, some of the perks would be balanced if other areas of the game were improved upon. Other perks are just useless all on their own. So let's look at how this can be fixed. Sound design. Everything's great except for the footsteps, which haven't improved from Black Ops 1. Treyarch needs to take a lesson from the old Infinity Ward here. They knew how to make footsteps, and perks were to the sound of those footsteps, integral parts of the game. It really doesn't say much for your audio if there is no reason to listen to it. Shock charges. There is a problem if a piece of equipment is useful in any situation, and that equipment is not a weapon. Just think what would happen if you could throw claymores like grenades, or if grenades stuck to the wall and waited until someone walked by. Pick one and balance accordingly, keeping in mind its interaction with tack mask. Sprinting. Extreme conditioning needs to be fixed. It could be changed to provide infinite sprint as in marathon, or it could be left alone and moved to tier 2 where it may compete. Decisions here will affect the pace of the game. A simple choice if you know what game you're making. The other problem related to dexterity sprinting requirement is map design. Treyarch's leads need to decide whether they're starting a new franchise for a cover-based team tactical shooter or sticking with the modern arcade-style FPS. Until they make that decision, there will continue to be balance issues throughout the game, this being, at best, a leadership problem. For all the improvements to the killstreaks compared to Modern Warfare 3, they need help as well. There is a heavy bias towards early killstreaks, with their only real purpose being to annoy other players. Think of the RCXD from Black Ops 1, it being used solely by players who prefer the chance of killing one over the chance to kill many. In Black Ops 2, the RCXD returns yet again, although it is heavily outmatched by the hunter-killer. This you simply throw into the air, and eventually it will ruin someone's day. That is its entire purpose. The RCXD had player interaction on its side, whereby players could drive around and have fun. The hunter-killer does not, making it either boring or aggravating. But this oversight is negligible compared to the lightning strike. As the user of the killstreak, it's great. It requires no effort for predicting where your opponents will be when you use it. They will be right where they are when you call it, being offered no chance to get away. Often they will not even be informed of their approaching doom until it has long since passed. In objective games such as Domination, this is a serious problem. It should go without saying that there needs to be a counter to a killstreak. Whether that counter is shooting it down or simply running away, there must be an option for players to affect their own experience. Without a counter, the developers are merely punishing players for completing objectives, something which is contrary to the point system for encouraging those players to participate. Guardian is useful for a very different purpose, camping. I must assume this was not its intended purpose, much like that of the tactical insertion. They both allow unique gameplay, but the time comes when the developer must realize they do nothing but take from the overall experience. It is important to separate the tactical use from the killstreak. It is not the ability to cut off small sections of the map that is a problem, but the means used to achieve it. The napalm strike is a much more appropriate fit for this task. 
modified to produce Treyarch's signature gas cloud, obscuring vision, slowing movement, and eventually killing. This airstrike would provide all the tactical options of Guardian, without all the problems. As with the perks, we have a series of simple problems, some of which show a fundamental disconnect in their design philosophy. These killstreaks in particular strike me as a desire to incorporate assumed period technology without considering the gameplay implications. This is not how to create atmosphere, unless of course the developers want their players to believe they put no thought into the game. But these are, of course, not the only problems with killstreaks. The Dragonfire, AGR, and VTOL suffer from the poorly designed network code. Those of you who played Black Ops 1 will remember this affecting the chopper gunner, which became so useless without host it often wasn't even worth using. It may seem that this issue is multiplying, but really it simply affects killstreaks that move. For the VTOL, its main problem is not its lack of accuracy, but its size and lack of armor. Unlike others, such as the Lodestar, the VTOL is enormous and incredibly easy to take down before it even arrives. As such, it's often a wasted killstreak, and it's a position after the Lodestar does not reflect that. Next, we have not a killstreak, but something which has interacted with killstreaks for quite some time. While most weapons or abilities have seen improvement from Black Ops 1, the knife is certainly not. It is terrible. Sometimes you can't even knife someone standing still. You have to pre-knife in order for it to connect, and that, combined with the lag comp, means you can forget about knifing entirely. Good luck to those who have built their reputation on it. For now, even turrets are immune to your grasp. For the final topic of this review, you can enjoy some COD 4 gameplay while I give mention to another unexplainable decision. Permanent unlocks from prestige mode. Entering prestige mode has always been about making a sacrifice just for prestige. There is no other reason to do it. If casual players are not prestiging, it's not because they're scared of it. It's because they don't want to invest the time for something they don't care about. It's an extra feature for those of us who play the game constantly, and an extra element of competition within this crowd. Removing a sacrifice takes away the prestige, so now we're left with a grind. A grind for absolutely nothing. Even MMORPGs give you more for your time, so I must say Treyarch missed the mark completely here. Casual players still don't prestige because they still don't care. In fact, the entire leveling system is a burden to the casual player, much like taking a party game to a friend's house, only to discover that none of the characters are unlocked and you have to play single player first. While for those of us who play for 60 hours straight after launch, there is no reward waiting for us in the future. It's really the worst of both worlds. Black Ops 1's prestige mode was good enough, but if you want to try something new, at least try something that might actually be useful. How about permanent locks instead of unlocks, preventing use of your preferred weapon with one more lock to each prestige until the end? At least that wouldn't cause boredom. To wrap things up, overall, Treyarch has broken the recent pattern whereby every COD release has been worse than its predecessor, but the bar wasn't exactly set very high. They have ambition, they strive for innovation, and they have the finances and talent available to achieve nearly any goal, yet they are careless in their pursuits. Every single issue with this game is extremely simple to detect and equally simple to fix. With one programmer working in his parents' basement, everything discussed earlier would be fixed in a month. With over a hundred paid professionals, there is no excuse for it to even be released in this state. But we all make mistakes, even those we pay not to. Thankfully, the mistakes made here are very easy to correct, and that's all it takes to bring out the truly excellent features in this release. That's all it takes to show us that we don't have to live in the past to experience Call of Duty.